But the biggest enemies of the Meyer case exist in the UFO community for whom this is a threat. And you will not find MUFON or ExoPolitics or anybody else pointing people. They won't even look at it or investigate it themselves. And believe me, I'm a little bulldog in trying to get them to do that in every way, shape possible. And some of the folks have taken an inordinate amount of time to figure out ways to decline to even investigate it when it's the only ongoing. It's ongoing now. His contacts are still going on in Switzerland. His material is being corroborated. You won't find it with the folks with the petitions. You won't find it with the Disclosure Project or Stephen Greer or anybody else. Michael Horn, the authorized American media representative for the Billy Meyer UFO contacts in Switzerland. He has uh, been researching the Meyer case since 79. He has recently returned from his 13th visit with Meyer in Switzerland, where things run right, by the way. Meyer claims that he has been meeting in person with extraterrestrial human beings for the past 70 years. And his case is one of the most controversial one in all of ufology, especially since, along with claims that he's the only authentic UFO contactee, oh, there are going to be some people take exception to that. He is said to be the seventh and final prophet for Earth humanity, whose previous incarnations include Enoch, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Emmanuel, falsely known as Jesus. Oh, boy. Look, the email box is actually on fire. And uh, Mohammed, such claims, along with many... UFO photographs and films have resulted in 22 documented assassination attempts against him in the past 40 years. Come on up here on the bridge and take that weird-looking chair over there, Michael. Welcome. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure to be on with you. Thank you for having me on, and uh, I guess we're both glad that radio is relatively bulletproof. Yeah, isn't that the truth? Now, tell us who tell tell us who Billy Meyer is. I heard about this a long time ago. I heard stuff like um, he was given a couple of books, all kinds of stuff. Well, uh, yeah, um, <laughs> there, it's almost like where do you begin, except at the beginning, uh, Billy Meyer is, as you uh, mentioned, somebody who claims to uh, be mm, approaching now the 70th year of contacts, meaning that uh, they started when he was a five-year-old boy, and he'll be 75 on February 3rd. He claims that these contacts, while they include elements of telepathy, they are, for the most part, fully physical, uh, face-to-face. They're not abductions. They're voluntary. They are with a uh, benign, if not benevolent, people, human beings. And uh, they have been going on, as we said, for 70 years with uh, very very specific reasons for them and even reasons as to um, how they've presented their evidence and their information. And uh, Meyer has uh, been a rather remarkable figure. He lost his left arm in, I think it was 1965, in a bus accident in Turkey. Uh, he was warned 10 years in advance that he would lose his arm and that he would have to learn to do everything in his life with one hand and that his duties and responsibilities would be many full times more once he had actually lost his arm than they were up until that time and that is proven to be the case he's the author of i think it's over 50 books now and uh, 26,000 plus pages of information including the books and the transcripts of his contacts with these people i'll only say the word alleged uh, once here in the beginning so that people will know i understand that uh, you know this is something people have to determine the authenticity of themselves. So we'll say once his alleged contacts with alleged extraterrestrials. And beyond that, I'll refer to it as, as I am familiar with it, as a matter of fact, and I'm certainly willing to you know, answer questions about it. But that's the Cliff Notes version of Billy Meyer. And, of course, like anybody's life, there's a lot more to it. The man was in the uh, late 50s also known as the Phantom in the Middle East, India and Pakistan. He was hired by police departments there to bring in alive, I might add, serial killers and mass murderers, people who were terrorizing the populace. He, from a very early age, had developed extremely steely nerves, and he was, he'd also developed uh, remarkable abilities with a handgun. And though he told me quite straight away he never killed anybody, he did defend himself and wound people who raised weapons at him. Other than that, in all cases, uh, he would successfully bring in these people uh, so that the authorities could take over uh, possession of them. And this is one of literally 350-odd uh, professions that he had over, mm, I think, a 12-year period while he traveled 40-some uh, thousand miles uh, on foot around the world. And, um, you know, we, we could say many things about who Billy Meyer is, but I, I think I'll let you uh, and, and your, your audience ask the questions uh, as to what you're, you're interested in beyond that. Well, well, I'm curious about how you hooked up with him and how you became the American media representative for him. Sure. Um, I first found out about the case in 1979. I walked into a bookstore in Los Angeles called the Bodhi Tree. Actually, I think it's in the West Hollywood area, and I'm not sure if it's still open. It was going to be closing. But anyhow, it was a metaphysical New Age type bookstore. I went in, and my eyes were attracted to a coffee table, you know, kind of photo book. 
and that book had the most remarkable clear photos of UFOs I had ever seen. And in 1979, I hadn't seen too many. But there was a ring of truth about the photos. I got the book. I read it. I read a little about the man and the investigation and evidence in it. And then uh, it would be another number of years until 1986 when I was in a small cafe in Sedona, Arizona, that uh, being there with my daughter and a lady I knew, we spoke to another man in the cafe while we waited for our little avocado sandwiches, as I am often stating the conditions uh, in that place. Uh, it was an interminable wait, but we did have a, an engaging conversation, and this uh, fellow, his name was Ralph, mentioned to me the contact reports, contact notes. I didn't know what that was uh, or those were, and it turned out that these were transcripts of Myers' conversations over uh, about a three-year period from 75 to 78. I was invited to come and get these when I returned to L.A. I did 1,800 pages of not well-translated, uh, very Germanic English translations, uh, which engaged me for several months just reading through this stuff. It was fascinating beyond belief, and uh, I, I didn't know what to do beyond that. I stuck them under the bed. Next step happened when I um, opened up a newspaper in 19, I think it was 88, and I saw a headline in the paper about uh, A-bomb testing tied to ozone damage. Lawrence Livermore Laboratories had a new finding with specific percentages of the ozone damage that they were attributing to atomic explosions, atmospheric testing. And the weird part for me was that I already knew the information and I was trying to figure out how. So a little you know, bell went off. I reached under the bed, pulled out the first 100 pages, and there was the first mention uh, Meyer was being told about this exact thing from 1975. He also mentions somewhere in those transcripts that he's being reminded because he was first told about this in the 1950s. Well, that kind of piqued my you know, interest, and several other types of, uh, of epiphanies like that happened when I found other information, such as earthquakes, oil uh, extraction, you know, interact, that there was a connection. There was a professor, Paul Siegel, from Stanford, and he was writing about the connection between extracting petroleum and uh, precipitating earthquakes. And, of course, I reached under the bed, and that was in there, too, and so on and so forth. I met a fellow named Randy Winters. He was representing information in the Meyer case. He and I went on and produced, co-produced something called the Pleiadian Connection videotape right around 1988. In the year 2000, well, I should mention that I started around that time to go and do some pr presentations myself. I had been Randy's opening act doing comedy and new age music comedy, and I decided I wanted to lecture on the Meyer case as he was doing. And in 2000, I made my first trip to Switzerland to meet Billy. Uh, it was in about 2004 I asked if I could officially represent them on a voluntary, as in for free, gratis, no pay basis so that I could maintain my independence of thought and disagreements should any arise, uh, whatever, that I could be my own person. We would not exchange money, and uh, they agreed, and uh, that's kind of how I got to that, and we just renewed the agreement this year for another seven years, hopefully. Wow. Well, now, when you say he's met with, uh, with these uh, extraterrestrials, I mean, did they, like, land and come out and talk to him? Or what, what was the nature of the meeting? Is it, is it, um, is it a telepathic thing? Is he, uh, is he able to actually be in their presence? I mean... Yeah, th these are actually good questions because there's, there's a lot of yes answers to all of that. He, his initial uh, experience was that with his father in the, about 1942, they saw a silver disc overhead, and he asked his dad what it was. His father thought it might have been a, a, you know, a secret weapon of Hitler's. Neither of them knew what it was, and then... Shortly thereafter, he, he kind of got uh, a, uh, a feeling to go deeper into the woods on, on the property where they lived. Uh, it was like a calling, a telepathic type of thing. And there was an elderly-looking man standing next to a pear-shaped craft supported on, I think, three strut-like legs. And the man looked to be about 90 years old, according to Meyer. He remembers this. And that he was dressed in something that at the time appeared to him to be uh, like a deep-sea diver suit without the helmet. And he said this man uh, had an, you know, a a presence that was benevolent, it was kindly, he felt no fear, and it was that first meeting where Meyer actually went on board the craft for the first time, and this began the education, the tutoring, the modification of his thinking abilities, many other things, starting at the age of five, so that by the time he was seven years old, he was said to have the thinking capacity of a 35-year-old man, and he was able to enlist the help of one of his school teachers and also the parish priest who had been telepathically contacted by these ETs. And uh, he was a kind of forward-thinking uh, parish priest, especially for the time and location, and he acted as a confidant to young five-, six-year-old Edward Albert Meyer to assure him and reassure him that these experiences were not you know, the work of the devil or what have you and that they would be good and safe for him. And so uh, he proceeded on in that way. And uh, one of his school teachers, I think it was a Mr. Lehman, had helped him as well when he uh, was writing 
uh, letters to send around the world about prophetic information, and when he was publishing a, a meditation tre treatise at about 10 years of age, there are many things about Meyer as a young boy and a young man people know absolutely nothing about, and they, uh, you know, if they know anything, it's usually, well, you know, the UFO debate, uh, which is the least important part of this, but I certainly don't mind, you know, standing strong about it, but as we, you know, delve into this and find out, we will understand that this man now frequently throughout his life has been on board with these people. And what happens for me when I visit him is sometimes it'll, I'll be sitting and talking to him and I'll think, either he has been on board with these people possibly an hour or two ago or they've been sitting here in the office with him. And, and he is a poker face. I mean, you would never, ever, ever know. He gives off no aura of specialness and look at me and it's just here's this man and you have a question i will try to answer it i may not know the answer uh, and it's a very very different experience than people presume on any level there's no drawing in you don't get drawn into something about oh my gosh extraterrestrials have been here uh, it's a where he lives it's what you'd call a high maintenance environment it's up in the rural rugged hill you know hilly uh, highlands uh, zurich highlands in switzerland it gets real cold it gets rainy it gets stormy and uh, these people are you know you could say, quote, unquote, farmers. They're people who live, uh, you know, in nature, uh, and they adapt to it, and they have to work and repair stuff all the time, and it's not uh, an armchair UFO, uh, quote, unquote, experts uh, environment or paradise. It's a very, very different uh, type of experience, and yes, physically with them in their presence, and that took a uh, training of him. he had to learn a meditational type of training to be able to be with them so that he could freely interact with them and vice versa because the vibrational difference between people who are that much more advanced than we are is a dissonance between the two and this is why when people are talking willy-nilly about contacts with extraterrestrials i have been uh, not shy about you know uh, sticking my nose into that and declaring it uh, in high need of real evidence at, at best and you know dubious to be polite about it i can if, if you want i can tell you we, we can have these experiences in our own world with other humans and know that we are uncomfortable with people who are more evolved than we are i've experienced that and i know that that can provoke in people uh, aggression and a state of feeling imbalanced and angry towards people we don't even know why but we our psyches react not well to those who vibrate at a higher frequency and if you talk about human beings who are already space and time travelers um, coming into contact with those of us who are uh, still crawling over each other for the last dollar, it's a very different frequency, and uh, I'll leave it at that for the moment. Well, yeah, you know, there's a, there, there's, it's got to be a little bit threatening to somebody that, you know, is in the presence of um, a highly evolved creature, and they themselves are the last person that you want to stand between that person and the last chicken wing, you know what I mean? But uh, <laughs> there, There's a good way of putting it. Yeah, i got a million of them. Uh, uh, w well... I'm hearing the music, but when we come back, you know what? what all, what's all this about books? You know, you know, you're liable to hear anything. I heard this many years ago. I think it was some. It was a program on uh, on the video, as it were. Was he given any books? Given books, um, I'm not quite sure what that would refer to. to yeah, you know, I'm not trying to put you on the clothesline here. It's just that, that oh, somebody was claiming that they had given him these books, um, that an, an ET had given Billy some books that had all kinds of futuristic data in it about all sorts of technological stuff. But li like I say. Sure. Particularly on television, you're liable to hear anything. So I just wanted to get that out there because this is the audience to, to tell it to. You know right. what I mean? Well, let me, uh, yeah, I, I can clarify it a bit. Since the 1950s, Meyer has been publishing specific information uh, pertaining to scientific information, environmental information, world event related information. In what are called the official context, starting in January, I think it's 28, 1975, Meyer started to. Uh, at the request of these Playaren extraterrestrials to transcribe all of their conversations between them. And whenever they would speak, uh, whether there was one person speaking with him or if he was with more than one person, he would have to number each of their sentences in order to, uh, you know, keep track of it that way. And he was wondering why he had to go through that trouble. Uh, it was, it's enough that he's a one-armed guy and he, he can type in German at over 60 words a minute, sometimes up to 100 words per minute. Uh, in the film that's freely available online, you can see a little bit of that. Uh, they told him that in the future people would, you know, of course, accuse him of backdating, uh, retrodicting, you know, basically falsifying and claiming that he had published things that he hadn't at the time. Oh. By putting the numbers in, this would give a consistent record in all of the transcripts that would be disseminated. Originally, 
in German, as well as any that were translated into other languages, making it impossible in this pre-computer age, 1975, you know, uh, for him to go back and alter these things. Now, just in, in all fairness to critics who said, well, some of these documents have different numbers, there's another thing that happens often. After he transcribes his contact, there are times when he has had more information about a particular thing given to him by the ETs, and that has found its way in, and sometimes the numbering sequence has been changed. And I understand if people would object to that, but we have so much verifiable, copyrighted, dated, published information that shows that he indeed, without any doubt, published these specific things well in advance of official discovery. I mean, anywhere from five months to 50 years. And there's it's quite an amount, and considering that we only have a few thousand pages translated into English out of 26,000 plus, there's just a wealth of material sitting in German waiting to be translated. So the books that they're talking about, these tra translations did find their way uh, into books. Wendell Stevens published four volumes of uh, better translations than I re you know, received. He, he was getting them translated uh, starting in about 78. And those came out as books, collector's items now, and we have them as e-books so people can just download them and not you know, spend hundreds of dollars for them. But uh, those transcripts, there's portions of them that are freely available online as well, and that may be what people are talking about. In that sense, he was given information that appeared in books. Any particular reason that, kind of, that might come to mind as to why Switzerland was uh, selected as a place to do this? Contact? Well, it, we could back it up to because Meyer live there, but we could say that th th those two things are probably interdependent because also Switzerland, uh, you know, is ostensibly the com country of peace and neutrality, although, in fact, recently, uh, within the past number of years, and not well known to all Swiss citizens, they've compromised their neutrality on a number of occasions. That's another story. But that was a, a, a location that would be in a country that uh, wasn't at war with anybody, you know, peace, neutrality, and the core teaching and message in the Meyer material has to do with love and peace and freedom and harmony. Now, those, let's say, four cornerstones might sound to some people rather simplistic, but if we uh, observe our world today and someone says, how would you, in, instead of this mess that we currently have, how about love and peace and freedom and harmony and everything that would go along with that, it might not seem quite so, uh, you know, uh, you know, simplistic or simple-minded to have those qualities permeate, pervade individual collective lives. Unbelievable. Well, now someone suggested in an email here that you may actually, when, when you talk to him, what is he like? Is he, uh, <laughs> I mean, is he, is he quiet? I mean, do you channel him in some way? I mean, no. <laughs> I know I'm getting out there a little bit, but hey, you know, it could happen, it could happen, right? No, no. Uh, one of the things that I noticed with Billy is there's a certain uniformity of the way he is with people. And I mean, I've seen him, of course, interact with family and friends, and strangers, uh, acquaintances, and he's... There is something that you would call a friendly neutrality. He, he's not defensive with people. He doesn't volunteer. He doesn't come up to people and start telling them stuff. He okay. actually is a fairly quiet person, and, but if he's around, like if you're in Switzerland and you're in the kitchen, let's say, and Billy comes in to get a cup of coffee, you can feel like with anybody, well, you know, maybe this guy doesn't want me to start badgering him, or you feel like, hey, you know, excuse me, I, I got a question for you, and you talk. There are some people, and I've known Billy for about 12 years, so... I can sit and meet with him at times, you know, and we spend time, and sometimes we literally joke about things, or uh, earlier on, some years ago, I was mainly, t one visitor, remember, I was talking to him about the, the hinges and the doors and the way they built their property to deal with the, the weather conditions and how, you know, the, the Swiss craftsmanship thing was uh, so evident there, even in this rugged environment. You know, I mean, just conversations. There are other things where, and I'll give you an example of something we discussed this last time, and this will tie in also to this idea of advanced information, so let me... Let me do it this way. Uh, in 1981, the first time, Meyer was given a piece of information uh, from what are called the Hanak or Enoch prophecies. In 1987, he was given a large amount of this information. All of this is freely available on the website. Nobody has to pay a dime to get it. Okay. I've had it up, I think, since about 2002 when I got the German uh, pamphlet and had it translated into English. Now, in that document, one of the weird things, and you know, maybe I can even you know, flip to it while we're we're speaking here, but uh, I just want to tell you about it. Anyhow, um, one of the weird things was that he mentioned uh, he mentioned this strange thing about uh, the Russians and uh, a place called, at the time I didn't even know it was a place, called Arkan, Arkhangelsk, I think it's pronounced. Um, and I was wondering, you know, what, what is this about? This just sounds so bizarre. 
for, here it is in the Hanak prophecies, where the, the title is Wars and Devastation in Europe and North America. Yet Russia will not rest and will attack Scandinavia, and in so doing will embroil all of Europe. And months before that, a terrible tornado will sweep, have swept across northern Europe, causing great devastation and destruction. Okay, here's where it starts. It must still be stated that the Russian attack will occur during the summer, in fact, starting from Arkhangelsk. Denmark will not be dragged into the war due to the insignificance of this country. Yet Russia will not be satisfied with this action of war, as her will for expansion will be ravenous, and consequently Russia will launch a military attack against Iran and Turkey and will conquer these two countries in bloody fighting, causing enormous destruction. Okay, that was the first thing. Then, a little later on, back to Russia and America, uh, America and Russia will have the most terrible weapons of mass destruction at their disposal a fact which is already the case to a certain extent today, now that's 1987, and will clash with violent force against each other at that time of conflict, whereby Canada will also be dragged into this conflict. The source of this conflict will substantiate the Russian attack on the American state of Alaska and against Canada. Now, what could be more bizarre than that? Yeah, yeah that's a little out of left field, isn't it? Yeah, except that in, 19, well, in July of this year, Russia announced troop movements to where? Arkhangelsk. Mm -hmm. They were going to move a bunch of troops. We've got a press release on the website. I'm not looking at it, but I can tell you it's up there and it's got all this. Within a month or so, or even weeks of that, Canada announced troop movements towards the Arctic. Arkhangelsk is in northern Russia somewhere, Siberia, northern Russia. Now, Russia, uh, now Canada decided to contest this a little bit by moving troops towards the Arctic. So when I was with Billy two months ago, I guess it was now, I said to him, listen, the first thing I want to ask you is this. This thing with the Russians have moved troops to Arkhangelsk. Canada's moved tr troops to the Arctic, and it's getting a bit testy over there. Uh, it seems to me like this is kind of what the Hanak prophecies were warning about. And he says, that's the beginning. And you will see other countries will start to lay claim, mineral rights, what have you, Arctic, perhaps even Antarctic. I'm going, well, we're seeing this unfold before our eyes. What's wrong with people? Why don't we get it? And that is, why, you know, the, the $64 million question. You know, when people say, well, give us some new prediction. Of what, you know, I don't believe you. Know, predict the numbers that I've got on a piece of paper on my television. So, you know, this kind of thinking. That information has been verifiably on my website for, you know, eight, nine years. I haven't altered it. It's in every version of the Hanak Prophecies, in books and everything else. This kind of specific, discreet information, bizarre, naming the city in Russia, mentioning Canada, and then within a month of each other, Russia and Canada make their first moves. That's pretty extraordinary, actually. And In fact, tell everybody your website right now, so while they're listening, they can take a look. Okay, sure. It's theyfly, T-H-E-Y-F as in Frank, O-Y, theyfly.com. And that is one of, at this point, I think we may have 150, literally, specific corroborated items scientific, world event related. There was one that I just put up, I think, earlier today because I have friends that send me these things. I see them and I don't. And this was an update on the 5,100-year-old Iceman. This is something that in uh, 1991, in one of his conversations, Meyer is told, as part of this overall conversation, oh, by the way, in several months, August or September, uh, people are going to discover the, uh, the body, a frozen body in the Austrian Alps, and this man will be 5,100 years old or whatever, uh, body, blah, blah. Oh, okay, well, yes, that happened. In this document in 91 was loosely disseminated, you know, as Meyer's documents are, people saw it, they handed it around, but it wasn't copyrighted officially. It was, however, in 1996, copyrighted, you know, in a copyrighted, I guess you would call it um, collection. They put out what they call contact blocks. Okay, so people could legitimately say, well, Meyer must have gone and backdated that, right? Here's where it gets kind of interesting. Five years later, in 2001, ten years after the discovery of the mummy, scientists take this mummy into a hospital in Italy because they now have the CT scan stuff, and they're going to figure out what killed the guy. They find out that there's a fractured skull, and there's an arrowhead in his back. And they, you know, logically deduced, hey, this guy must have been slain in a big battle. He must have been you know, running from uh, people, you know, and, and someone got him with an arrow. Hmm, okay, so I went Michael. back. And Michael. I went, I want you to I want you to hold us in suspense okay. for a second, but where we where we left off. So sure. they do a CT scan on the Ice Man, and there's an arrow in him. Yeah. Now, of course, when you think about it, 50, 100 years ago, up in the uh, rugged Austrian Alps, a uh, person could die from frostbite, uh, avalanche, drowning, food poisoning, freezing to death. You know, hypothermia. He could be killed by other people with various weapons, mauled to death by a bear, etc. So, but they found that he had uh, an arrow in him. So I went back to look at the document, and Meyer had asked Bata the. Uh, 
the extraterrestrial, what killed the guy? He said, well, he had a seizure and he fell. Okay, that could account for his, you know, having a skull concussion. And, says the uh, ET, he fell on one of his arrows. That was verifiably published five years before either the fractured skull or the wow. arrow were discovered. Now, here's the thing. We've got all this information freely available on the website. I've got a page like uh, corroborated. What do I call it? Let me see what I call this thing here. I've got a couple pages. I've got one that says corroborated information sources and special evidence for C2C and radio shows. And, uh, you know, I've got prophecies and predictions. I'm going to get this website kind of updated and brought into the 21st century, but it didn't happen in time for the show. But suffice it to say, there is a search engine, and if you pick up on a word or two or something and you can't, you know, uh, you can search and find it, hopefully. And if you can't, Yes, I answer all my emails, but it just takes time because uh, even without radio show, we get a lot of emails from people finding this stuff here and there. But I can always take a moment, uh, you know, during a few days to, to respond and send links to people if they don't find it. There is so much. The Jupiter IO information is perhaps, uh, to me, another one of these things that simply uh, categorically proves the authenticity of the case. And people say, well, how can that, you know, be? Uh, you know, what do you mean? Well, Meyer, in 1978, published information, uh, a transcript, actually, where he's talking to this extraterrestrial symbiose, this woman, and they're sensibly they're hovering near Jupiter, and he's describing things like, well, you know, as, as you had said, Jupiter does have rings, and, and uh, there's Io, I recall, he says, you were telling me that this was the most volcanically active body in the solar system with a smooth surface and this and that. He's going on and on, and then he describes Europa as encrusted in ice. Five months later... The Voyager probe got to Jupiter. Yes, they confirmed that there were rings there. But on March 12, 1979, an announcement was made by NASA, NASA, I guess, JPL. And they said the most important discovery of the Voyager mission is that Io is the most volcanically active body in the solar system. Now, how do we know that Meyer actually wrote that beforehand? Well... It just so happens that Wendell Stevens, in his one of his books, one of his copyrighted books, published something, a, a casual sentence about, I have had the information from the 115th contact in my possession since March 9th, 1979. That's the contact with all the Jupiter information. That's three Excellent. days before NASA announces it. But there were 12 predictions in that information that he was not supposed to have, because predictions are things that will come true with certainty, and Meyer was never allowed to release those kinds of things in advance. And do you have that sort of list on you? Um, I can I can bring it up because it's also on my website. Uh, all those right. things all happened. You know, Let's you know. do it after the break because sure. Michael Horn, if uh, if you well, did you want to finish up on a, on a, on a thought before the, uh, the the little break there, or should we go on to some more questions? Because I got a lot of them. You know what? As far as predictions and stuff go, if if I can say now that we have an abundance of documentation on the website, and people, if, they, if they're patient, they do a little searching. Uh, my blog also has things like I, I update now more regularly on my blog whenever there's new confirmation of Myers' uh, prophetic information. If there's really a problem finding anything or if somebody has a real issue and they email you about it. But I think that there's you know more important things uh, to get to, such as uh, the questions you're about to ask. And, and ultimately, uh, if this is true, what's the real reason for all this? And what do we do about it? And, you know, uh, yes. stuff like that. So uh, I'll, I'll take any questions that you have, of course. Well, let me ask you this. Now, does Billy believe in God? No. There are zero beliefs involved in the Meyer material. Okay. And this is, of course, uh, one of the things that I think has uh, helped, quote-unquote, earn Billy uh, 22 attempts in his life. And this is a core part of the entire Meyer context, and not only of the Meyer context, but in this case, this goes back a very long time. Here's uh, an explanation as best I can muster at this time of night. The Pelearan extraterrestrials, their own forefathers, were in many cases, along with some other extraterrestrials at times, the gods of our you know, history, prehistory, the ones around whom religions were formed, and most notably, although not exclusively, the gods of the Old Testament, and the prophets that go back to, as, as you mentioned at the beginning, Enoch, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, Emmanuel, who's only mentioned once that I know of in the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, 
the information in this case claims that that was the name, the real name of the man, as foretold in Isaiah, who was later, uh, and they say falsely, called Jesus Christ, a person for whom there really is no historical record, and, and another prophet named Muhammad. All of them were basically publishing, if you will, the same spiritual teaching, which was virtually each time corrupted, uh, channeled into religious or sectarian forms. The various gods of our past, these extraterrestrials, were uh, given the attribution of you know, the creators of all things, and um, we have Bibles and holy books. All of this, according to the information in this case, is part of the main reason why these contacts are taking place now, because in each of the previous six prophets, they were each personality was simply a further uh, future incarnation of the same spirit that was doing this prophet gig, if you will. It's a very thankless job. So from Enoch through Mohammed, and what they're saying is Billy is the last. There's going to be seven prophets for Earth, from Earth. And my own take on it, to maybe lighten it up a little bit, is that whenever you know these guys, whoever they were, were sitting around waiting to figure out who the seventh prophet would be, they, they said something like, well, um, how about this time, instead of some firebrand uh, overturning tables or riding around on a horse you know, with a flaming sword, how about by the time people find out about him, he will be a late middle-aged, pot-bellied, one-armed, gray-bearded farmer living in Switzerland. No charisma, no, no, you know, no religion to be started around this guy. And during the electronic age, we can get this spiritual teaching put into the world and maintained and preserved for centuries to come so that finally people can get their heads on straight and get out of beliefs because there was no deity that created everything. There is, it's even more uh, huge in terms of reality, what, what this creation is, this universe, and how it came into being, and w what are the laws of this universe, and how do things work, and where did they come from, and who created this, and what created... You know, all of the profound, really vast questions of existence are addressed mainly in the spiritual teaching, the consciousness-related teaching in the Meyer case. And when you come down to it, the reason, when, when I answered your question, no, there's no God according to Meyer, because this is all about complete, total, 100% self-responsibility for each human being for their own lives. You cannot do things that are out of integrity or that violate certain laws such as cause and effect and expect that some mythical being or even some human being can give you magic words and absolve you of damage that you've done let's say, to others, or mistakes that you've made that have contributed to other mistakes. If we learn to, to observe our own thoughts and feelings before we act, if we slow it down and say, there's nobody standing above me who's going to dip me in molten lead if I you know, don't chant or if I don't pray or if I don't believe, I am responsible for this life and how I treat other people, what I do with my life, what I do with our you know, environment, all these things, these little niggling, discreet moments in life, strung together, consciously create a life. If we turn it over to beliefs, which means we don't know the truth, this is the age of beliefs, we're still moving out of this into the age of truth and knowledge, where we find out this should be a scientist's dream, because they're not asked to believe anything here. And Meyer consistently published, for instance, black holes, you know, I just have to jump into that. Uh, Meyer had written about that a long time ago, but then he asked the player at one point, well, it, it would seem to me in life, you know, in the universe, there's opposites, there's polar opposites for everything. And they said, yes, there's something, a, 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 I think they called it a space curvature. And the, the correct term, it's in my blog, how they described it, they said, these are kind of convex, uh, not holes, but rather uh, formations that repel things away. Instead of drawing them in like a black hole, they repel energy for billions of light years. This is a whole other thing your scientists haven't discovered it yet. And as far as I know, they still haven't. But there's so many other things in there that when you really go, oh, wait a minute, how could he have published this about Mars in 1976? And we just discovered it in August of 2008. How could he have published this about Jupiter and Venus and the rest? Well, then you get to the sticky stuff about God and, and religion and beliefs, and they say, look, there's just nothing out there. This universe, this creation, is this intelligence itself. We we will never quite fathom what we are in and what has given us life, but our task in life is to evolve over countless millions of lifetimes in a spiritual and consciousness-related way to progress in understanding. We will ultimately, not as the current personalities, but ultimately as spiritual beings, we will remerge with that force, and this stands so much vastly above 
any kind of religious concepts, and there's nothing to fear. We're not punished if we don't do this, if we don't read the Meyer material or don't, you know, agree with it. it this is about that freedom, one of those cornerstones. Well, you know, the thing about it is, Michael, now this, this sort of thing really, this, this, this is the kind of stuff that really tweaks people up, that are people that identify themselves as people of faith, and that is, and I, I personally don't understand why science and what we call religion now, strictly speaking, religion is just something that you do regularly. <laughs> but the spirituality and the belief in God and so forth, I don't understand why, why science and faith in a supreme being are somehow mutually exclusive, because really science just determines what is, studies it. I mean, I ask, for example, I, I ask a, um, he's a pretty rational, learned man, he claims to have worked for NASA and the Air Force and everything else, I, I have no reason to dispute this. Uh, but I said, look, how does somebody, for example, come up with a fluorescent light tube? Does somebody just go, well, I think I'm going to design a tube-shaped light and coat it with a uh, reactive material inside and run some DC power through. And his answer was, well, typically these things happen because they're fooling around in the laboratory and they create this effect, and, and then the application for it comes later, which makes perfect sense. Mm-hmm. So w- since we have consequences for bad choices that we make just on the pedestrian level, why would there be no consequences? I mean, somebody, some, something imposes these, hey, doc, it hurts when I do this. And the doc says, well, quit doing that. I mean, the, this simple principle, the simplistic principle seems to apply to many things in life. Well, why, does, why are these things mutually exclusive? There's, there are causes and there are effects. Sometimes causes are smaller than their effects, and sometimes there's a big cause and, and not much effect. But these things do exist. Can you elaborate on that a little? Yeah, you've hit on, like, one of the core elements here, and that is the immutable laws of cause and effect. Now, while it, let's not say that we can answer how all of the laws of this universe came to be. We would people who are quote unquote people of faith, religious, are going to believe it's this. Other people may believe or think or presume it's something else. But what we do know unfailingly is that the laws of cause and effect are given. Uh, they are physic, physics, physical laws, and they are laws on every level of operation. Therefore, it doesn't actually require any faith in anything. It to you know to observe is to we, we learn the less preconception, the less faith we have in anything, the more objective and logical we are, the more we can learn and deduce and you know struggle to figure things out. Some of the inventions, like you said, happen that way. It's an accident. Well what do we do with this? Other things, people even in dreams, they see something and then they they make it. Uh, or they'll actually figure out and solve a problem. Because as as Meyer was told by one of the ETs, they, they said you know, the problem the Earth people have, one of them, is that they think that every great discovery and every you know, magnificent thing must be the creation of an extraterrestrial for some reason. They don't give themselves credit because they're so used to not understanding that they're responsible for their lives and for what they do and that human beings carry genius within them uh, and you know, magnificence and creativity. And this is what should be exercised and not uh, you know, fear and doubt about your abilities, but experiment. Mistakes are part of the learning process. We needn't be guilty unless we continue to make the same mistake over and over and don't learn. So science and what is presented in the Meyer material have really no opposition because you're not asked to believe that Billy Meyer's meeting with extraterrestrials. What instead we're saying, here is the evidence that we can put on the table. Yes, he's got the best physical evidence. People can argue forever about UFO photos and films all they want. But when you start to get into scientific information where I can hold up a book with a copyright and a, you know, or a document or something, we know that when it was published, when it was online, and it's specific. He's naming the city that the Russians are going to, you know, launch their attacks from, and that Canada's involved in here. It's been sitting up on the Internet for eight, nine years, and he describes Jupiter. The skeptics tried to attack the Jupiter information and ended up confirming it. This is the kind of thing that happens, and so few people proportionately really know. All the rumor is, well, this guy's a hoaxer, and his wife said he's a hoaxer, and therefore it's all a hoax. Gosh, do some homework, folks. And you know, take the UFO thing out of this. It, I just, you know, you've given me a moment to jump in. Cover-ups and UFO stuff at this point, my claim is the only UFO cover-up that you can really do anything about yourself is the Meyer case. And then you don't need the government to tell you that it knows or has something. That stuff will never go anywhere. Witness, it hasn't. All the petitions and the, and the talk about it's not that Roswell didn't happen. It sure did. And other crashes have happened. But there's no evidence left. And if you're trying to demand the government confirm something that you can't prove, you get the result that these petitions get deservedly. They get well, that, yeah, that's pretty easy to stonewall something like that. Now, you know, we, we have to take these breaks. There's only a couple of minutes. But, but let me ask you quickly, why did they come here and why did they contact Billy? What was the point of contacting Billy? Is he supposed to pass on these predictions? Is he? Yeah. 
Yeah, you got it. Well, as I said, there were six previous prophets. All were subsequent incarnations or reincarnations of the, the evolving spirit form that had been prepared to do this gig on Earth. And because the ancestors of these people so heartily participated in screwing us up with religions, pardon me, and misleading and all the rest, they had a self-obligated. They weren't compelled to do it, but they wanted to help straighten it out. And now analyzing things at this point, they figured, and I just put up a new blog tonight, someone had written a really good thing about why the evidence was never so incontrovertible that everybody would have to believe that there's an element of free will that must exist in a world with 8 billion people, 7.5 billion of which might go nuts if they were forced to believe this was true. Understood. I have to ask you this. Why? Well, now Billy is uh, Billy Meyer is supposed to be the soul contact, yes? Yes. Does that mean that everybody else who thinks they've seen uh, extraterrestrial activity come earthbound is like out to lunch? What, what does this mean, Michael? Well, here's the thing about seeing extraterrestrial activity. Um... Lots of people have seen UFOs. I've had seven UFO sightings, the most recent, two months ago, in Brazil. Seeing UFOs doesn't mean we're seeing extraterrestrial craft. Um, seeing objects in the sky uh, is an unreliable means of making a claim about their origin. There may be some, and there are, according to this information, there are some extraterrestrial craft that are seen. Most of them, according to the Meyer material, during these times, are secret military craft uh, from predominantly from five different countries. And there are different groups, highly secret groups, that have alternative craft that do not have the capabilities of true extraterrestrial craft but are pretty nifty. And, and uh, some have some kind of anti-gravity technology, apparently, and they can do some remarkable things. But people who think that they've had contact with extraterrestrials, rather than my disparage them, you know, out of, out of hand, which I certainly have done, I would say, well, present evidence that is comparable to the evidence in the Meyer case that we can show scientifically is valid uh, from everything from testing of photos and sound recordings and metal samples, but especially the scientific information, we can show that that is accurate and verifiable and authentic and true. But how come to this day none of the people who claim to be contactees or even abductees can prove that there is any extraterrestrial connection to them. Have people had strange experiences? Well, I'm sure. Meyer has said most of the actual abduction experiences have been secret military psyops. There have been, in the past maybe 40 years, a certain very, very small number of actual extraterrestrial, what they call, contact examinations, where people indeed were taken aboard a craft and examined and set back down. But this hysteria about uh, benevolent extraterrestrials among us and women with hybrid babies. Well, we're, show us a baby already, you know, and uh, all the people that think or claim to be contactees. Well, I don't have anything against people being contactees, but nobody has been able to put the evidence on the table. Now, something I've never made a big deal out of, but I'll, I'll, I'll make it a little more to put this in perspective. I can prove that I received specific information from the play Aaron via Billy. They didn't give it directly to me, but it was sent to me, the transcript, pertaining to something I was involved in that I did not know was a setup and a trap and would have been enormously destructive to me and Meyer and many people had I marched along kind of naively in a project that I had been offered. It was only because these people looked into it and accurately foretold what was going on that I extricated myself. It turned out that after I extricated myself from a project, the very person they identified launched a th an attack online, 300 specific instances of attacking Meyer and me, including death threats. I was able to get three separate Internet hosting companies to take his site down consecutively because it was so outrageous. And this is someone who had approached me as a peace and love type of a thing. We'll do this project. I'm the opponent. You're the proponent. It'll all be nice. They told exactly what that was about. That can be determined legally by going to our servers. The, that document was emailed to me before this all happened. And then, last but not least, on October 3rd at 10 p.m. at night, when I was living for almost six months in the mountains of Brazil, I had this impulse to open the door in the dead of night and step outside. And I lived in a pretty dark place. I looked up and my eye, I saw a star, I thought. And then a funny thing happened, but that the star started to slowly and smoothly descend, moving down to the left and away from me within 20 feet of me, because I realized as I was trying to figure this out in my head, it's not a firefly. It's not being obliterated by the trees that are within 8, 10 feet of where I stand. So this thing's within 20 feet of me. It's a 
consciously controlled object, and oh my goodness. So when I went to Switzerland one week later, that was the first question I asked Billy. I said, okay, this is what I saw. He says, oh yeah, that's one of the telemeter disks, one of the small monitoring craft from the play iron. Okay, I cannot prove that that happened. I can, of course, prove that I received the warning. It's, it's on my website. I've got all the emails and everything up there. But for those people that are running around yammering about being contactees and disclosure and the rest of it, hi, I have proof positive of receiving communication from these extraterrestrials, and if you want to do some form of testing me, I think I'm you know, fine, I'm telling the truth here. I was within 20 feet of one of their small monitoring crafts. Now, that and about six bucks gets me a cappuccino somewhere. So what? Is that what it's about? No, it isn't. And you were, I think, going to also ask the question of, well, why Meyer? And why these claims that he's the only contactee, right? That's it, yeah. And, and uh, more, more to the point, why, didn't he, why doesn't he go public through the media? Well, um, you know, as I say, kind of go backwards in the answers. Meyer has had 22 attempts in his life. He tried to make some presentations in Europe starting in the later 70s, and he found that he didn't have a particular gift for it. And it wasn't really his job, although he was being chastised by these ETs. If you ever read some of the uh, contacts where they discuss the most mundane things about the people he's working with and the group and who's doing I mean, you'd think, well, why do they take all this time? Let's get to the juicy stuff. But it really it validated the authenticity. So they were saying to him, can't you get out there and present and show your foot? It, you know, I'm not good at it, and people are, you know, giving me a hard time. So basically it was it will come to other people to carry this torch for you. He's, his job is to get this information put into the world. It's not to be a celebrity. He isn't. He isn't a cult leader. He doesn't have 19 girlfriends and 50 Rolls Royces. He works real hard at writing. His task at the center, he's got a family, and he stays away from people he doesn't know. And he doesn't court appearances. He's done very, very few interviews. I interviewed him last, as I said, on about oh, maybe the 16th of October when I was there. 15th and 16th, we, we sat down and I taped some stuff. It's not his gig. He puts it out, and it's really for the rest of the world to translate it into their own languages if they want it. These people that work with him have enough to do to get it all you know, tidy and together, publish it in German, the nice books and what have you. And as for why he's the, the only one, and this irritates people. I don't know why it bothers people that a man has such a thankless, miserable job that people have tried to kill him 22 times to kidnap his kids at knife point. They've cut the brake line on his cars. They've tried to destroy his home. Why are people so envious of this? They want to be special? No one would want their arm ripped off their body. You know, I mean, saying a bitter divorce after 30 years, all this stuff. He's a human being. And he was groomed for this gig because the spirit, not the personality, had done it before. And this personality could be brought up to speed with much tutoring, as all the previous prophets had, to do this rather thankless job, be cursed out by people, ridiculed, all the rest, shot at. And he never complains about it. He never stops. You know, the first time a bullet whizzes by your head and it misses you, there's a little invisible trail that says, we suggest a career change. He never read that. Or if he did, he laughed at it. He had a dream. If people, you know, people can see the film for free, an hour and a half documentary, he talks about the dream he had that protected him against an assassination attempt and how he put this metal plate in a little agenda book in a pocket right near his heart. And sure enough, the next day when he had that there, someone walked up and point blank shot him with a handgun. Um, you know, all you folks that think you're contact tees for extraterrestrials, you might want to reconsider those claims. And the thing is, we don't need to be contact tees for extraterrestrials. I couldn't go into a university where they're teaching astrophysics and, and say uh, to the top professor there, uh, explain the whole thing to me in 15 minutes or whatever. You know, let's get things given to us that have been, and let's study and learn. Let's work with others who can help us. Let's vet this information and find out if it's true. If so, what's the value? And it comes down to the very thing of, of individual work. I, you know, I'm going to pitch one thing. Yes, I've got, you know, books and stuff. There's one thing I'll pitch to people if they want a kind of foundational thing. I've got a little program called Standing in Spirit. I even have it downloadable for like seven bucks or something. It's something that Meyer specifically asked me to do at the end of every lecture. I sent it to him. I said, hey, Billy, I do. This is my own stuff. I do. If you don't want it associated with the, the work you're doing, I'll put it on a separate website. He said, no, do that at the end of every lecture. That embodies what we're talking about in consciousness, self-responsibility. Do that. So I said, fine. And it's up there. I have a DVD or I've got a downloadable. That's my pitch because that's the work. And it's not the only way to get there. We have so much of the spiritual teaching freely available in that section on the website. You can read it. You can study it. You can think about it. You can reject it. You can try it. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff there, more, more than we're going to be able to go into in yeah. four hours tonight, or three hours tonight, that's for sure. Michael, um, hmm. this is, I'll tell you what, my... I, I, I'm a little dubious of using this expression, but there's there's so there's so much information here that uh, you know I'm having to 
like tighten up my headphones down to get my brains inside my head um, <laughs> instead of, you know, like coming out of my ears. Um, yeah. What a disgusting visual if you think about it. Um, <laughs> where are we headed with, with, with Billy? Um, he's made some pretty rough predictions. Well, yeah. Um, I, I, I tend to be somewhat optimistic, and I have said that my personal mission is to help prove the prophecies wrong. That means that that intention is for many of these things to not come to fruition, to not occur. I'm also a realist, and I would say we're not doing a real great job on a few levels. Uh, you know, Fukushima, according to the play Aaron, was a worst-case, super worst-case disaster almost from the get-go, the meltdowns and all this stuff. They told Meyer about it in March. Uh, the BP oil disaster, that hasn't gone away. The you know, the, the damage to the food chain, to the environment, all these things. And, and I don't want to do the doom and gloom thing, but you've asked a question. Well, let's do doom and gloom, man, because I'll tell you, people are worried big time. They're, they're worried about coming fa uh, famines. I believe it was Brenda sent an email a while ago and said, will you please get them to give us a little insight on any coming famine, if something bad's going to happen in 2012? I mean... Yeah, um, well, here's the thing. If we read the Meyer material and, and study, he has been saying for over 50 years, there... What's, Meyer was the first person to talk about climate change and global warming in 1951 and 58 as a 14 and a 21-year-old man warning about things. He was warning in 58 about the debt crisis. He, was, he warned about the, the disease called AIDS by name. He predicted the two U.S. wars with Iraq. I mean, all this stuff, it's mind-boggling. Okay, famine. Those things are coming if we don't succeed in in changing course and quite honestly some of this stuff is going to happen because we've gone past the point of no return where we could have been altering the trajectory of that pendulum we sent out now it's coming back like a wrecking ball so well unless i'm very much mistaken uh, michael wh where was this information available i mean i only heard about him i didn't i didn't know where i could actually find anything that um yes had been translated or anything else i mean i was just sort of wandering around i'd heard his name but i mean how are we supposed to get this information absolutely right and here's what happened when meyer was a young guy as i said 14 and and 21 he sent out letters typewritten letters up to three thousand of them to uh different countries and people uh, he maybe got two answers or four answers out of all of that uh, you're talking now you move into the 70s remember i said i saw his book in 1979 his, his stuff was getting around europe in let's say the 75 latter part of 75 he's publishing but Meyer has been, this is the most suppressed story, the CIA and other intelligence services, and this isn't conspiracy theory, they have been involved in watching and monitoring this so closely. Uh, I didn't put the link up, it's probably somewhere on my blog. There is a guy that wrote a two-part blog on ufodigest.com telling the story that Wendell and Lee had both told me about how they were picked up all the time, starting in about 78 going in and out of London on their way to Zurich, even without reservations. They would just hop on a plane. They were picked up by a chauffeur for the CIA from the Grosner House, which is uh, in London, and it's still, I think, there's now a U.S. Embassy. It was the uh, field office for the CIA, and the man's name was Robert Nathan. They would pick these the investigators up coming in to, to London on the way to Zurich, and from Zurich through London, they would ask them to please give them the photographs and any information. They would take it in another room. Uh, 20, 30 minutes later, they would be given back the stuff. Meyer was observed. There is a military base literally up the road above his property. The CIA had occupied that post for a long time. Four or five years ago, I said to Billy, well, is the CIA still in there? He says, no, 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 they don't need to be that close. Their equipment is so sophisticated, they can monitor us from a great distance away. And then he said in his characteristic kind of innocent way, I don't know why they don't just come and knock on the door. We really don't have any secrets here. And this is the problem. The CIA admitted to uh, Jim Delatosa that they had a photograph of one of the play iron craft over the uh, Myers area there. And they said, no, we're not giving it to you for examination. And this conversation never happened. This stuff is the, the problem is, yes, the intelligence agencies and the governments and the media have suppressed this or ridiculed it when it comes up. But the biggest enemies of the Meyer case exist in the UFO community for whom this is a threat. And you will not find MUFON or Exopolitics or anybody else pointing people. They won't even look at it or investigate it themselves. And believe me, I'm a little bulldog in trying to get them to do that in every way, shape possible. And some of the folks have taken an inordinate amount of time to figure out ways to decline to even investigate it when it's the only ongoing. It's ongoing now. His contacts are still going on in Switzerland. His material is being corroborated. You won't find it with the folks with the petitions. You won't find it with the Disclosure Project or Stephen Greer or anybody else. The difference between a contactee is an ET walks up to you and talks to you, whereas an observation like those boys did at RAF Bentwater some years ago right. where the craft was there, that's, that's different. 
I think so. I observe. I don't call, call myself a contactee. And even though they sent information to me, I'm not a contactee. Gotcha. So please, you know, everybody, give it a Well, breath. I think it's important to make that distinction, I'm, and I'm glad that, uh, that we discuss it, even if it was just five seconds worth. It's very salient. Yes. Why don't we talk to, let's see, let's talk to Tom, Iron Mountain, Missouri. Tom, you on the bridge? Hi. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Hi. Good there. morning. Um, I just, I got a question about the, uh, the seven prophets, and I find it kind of surprising and yet unsurprising that Jesus Christ is left out. Um, I'm wondering what makes um, your guests so sure that they're not dealing with demonic entities of some kind who aren't masquerading as ETs. Would you like me to answer that as best I can? Sure. Sure. Well, the idea of demonic entities is in itself a belief. We don't have objective evidence of demonic entities. Now, you and other people may believe that there are such things, but if I, who aspires to, let's say, a more objective and scientific perspective, have no evidence for that, then I don't have that as a consideration. It is fair to say, do we, how do we know if this man is telling the truth or you know, if he's a deceiver or a hoaxer? And what I've tried to establish before is to say, there's a foundation of actual scientific evidence in this case, a substantial amount, that gives a foundation of credibility that should be sufficient to only encourage us to look into this information further for ourselves, not to believe anything. Even Let's just say that everything I told you about the science stuff is true. That doesn't mean, to me even, that everything else is true. As a matter of fact, I don't know about a couple things in this case, and I'm, I'm not trying to get off of your demonic thing, but... Uh, chemtrails and crop circles. I don't know that the perspective that I understand has been presented in this case is true. I don't know it. So I don't have to believe it. I'm free from believing and say, well, Billy Meyer said it. It must be true that it's this way. Same thing with the idea of demonic uh, entities or anything else. I, I, I can't go there because I don't have evidence that such things exist. That's all. And, you know, that's the best I can do with that. That's, that's, uh, that's interesting. What do the... Um what do the ETs say ab about the creation of the universe, or do they? Yeah, they have a lot to say, and it's pretty mind-boggling, because the term you use, the creation of the universe, they call this universe the creation, and that we are living in a creation, a universe that is one of literally countless billions of other already existing universes, not planets, not galaxies, you know, universes, and it is mind-boggling. They have quite a bit of information, and they know of at least two other universes, one a parallel sister universe to ours, that they have entered and gone into, where there's an, uh, a sister race to them of human beings, and another one that they recently discovered where we will penetrate into, about which I don't have any information. There may be in German. If people read German, you know, hit the, hit the site there and uh, read away and, and get the books if you wish. But we... We can't quite wrap our minds around this because we are even cellularly conditioned, whether we're religious or not, we're kind of inoculated with these religious thought forms about gray-bearded you know, sky daddies uh, flying around the gods and all of this stuff. And it, it, how can it create a universe, an impersonal universe, exist? Where did it come from? Who in, created that? And they do have information on that, but it's, it's a little beyond uh, what I would try to explain right now, because it, frankly, it wouldn't, it wouldn't answer those questions. They're going to say, you know, that <laughs> this universe is not 13 billion years old, it's 47 trillion years old. It's going to live for another 100 trillion years and then contract and uh, then rebirth itself after a long slumber. And, and they are talking on very scientific levels. We probably have no means right now to determine the accuracy of that information. Let me ask you a quick one here. What, what is this? I saw it noted here. I'm looking around for it right now because I've got about 15 notes about you, Mr. Horn. What, what's this about the India and China um, getting into a tangle? Yeah, uh, I think that's also in the Hanak prophecies from 1987. And maybe while I'm, you know, uh, okay. tap dancing here, I'll be able to actually bring it up. Uh, that is something that Meyer has long warned about, um, that uh, India and China uh, are going to have a rather unpleasant experience together, especially for India. I can read it directly to you in a sentence or two. Um, and China becomes dangerous, especially to India, as also at this time China maintains uneasy relations with her. China will attack 
India. And if biological weapons are used, around 30 million human beings will be killed in the area of and around New Delhi alone. However, this will not be the end yet because the effect of biological bombs and missiles, etc., used cannot be controlled at this time, and, there, and terrible epidemics unknown up to that point in time will arise and spread quickly. Also, Pakistan will allow herself to be misled to instigate a war against India, which will be especially dangerous in view of the fact that both countries are developing atomic weapons. 1987. Now, wow. that's, but here's that's not bad. Keep going. Keep going. That's cool. The kicker is that this wasn't written in 1987. This is ostensibly the original contemporarily phrased version of Enoch's actual predictions from thousands of years ago before these countries even had these names. Russia didn't exist, what, eight, ten thousand years ago, whatever they're attributing to e Enoch. So the so-called book of Enoch that floats about is not the real writing of Enoch. It certainly doesn't contain these prophecies. This is thousands of years old warning about things that we are seeing in front of our eyes, as we also have, have uh, been warned in here about civil wars coming where? To the U.S. Yet, to say when? Well, here's how it reads. It, civil wars and anarchy in America. 1987, going back even farther. Yet the misery on earth will continue as two terrible civil wars will break out in America, whereby one will follow the other. Afterwards, the United States of America will break apart and deadly hostility will prevail among her, which then leads to the division into five different territories. And it cannot be prevented that sectarian fanatics will play a dictatorial role. Now, this reads a little differently than, hi, we are the Space Brothers, come here to tell you that you are masters walking in love and light and you're going to ascend to the fifth dimension. So we are faced with enormously specific things that we can now see. Look, when I first read that thing about civil wars in America, as I've said many times, I literally laughed. I thought, what are they talking about? I'm not laughing now. The polarization, political, uh, religious, every way, shape, and form, the flavors of this kind of strife and conflict among the citizens here. Yes. It's undeniable, really. Yeah, and again, this one man, this one one-armed man that's called a hoaxer building models of UFOs by dunderheads in the UFO community, of all things, and skeptics who are afraid to look at this, has published. These are things we can see unfolding. I've said this to people. Well, I want a new prediction. No, read the ones that we can even verifiably date as, as being online for five, eight, ten years and start looking at the things that are unfolding now and how specifically Meyer foretold them. This, well, the only problem with predictions is, is, you know, it's almost like by the time the real stories get to the, uh, the, um, the mainstream media, they're no longer news and the game is far afoot by then so i'm just wondering even if we do go back and look at this stuff since it since these predictions were made so long ago well where are we now if we're on the verge of it then there's uh, of an event then is there any stopping it yeah and how you know well you know the we could have had a third world war uh, even 15 years ago there, meyer has given any number of dates saying look these are the years in which a third world war could erupt and fortunately enough people in the world whether they know about the meyer case or not don't want that they're fighting, if you will, for peace, or they're working towards peace. And so it, when people come together and they're using their thoughts and their feelings and their actions in a conscious way, not just, pardon me, camping out somewhere to protest against the power brokers. That's not a plan of action. It, the plan of action is to develop. You have to think things through and come together. This is hard work. We're so far in the hole here. It, it's, a bit, it, it's a bit, you know, heavy to deal with. Folks, this is about seeing things as they are, not as we would like them to be or pretend they are. That's why all this entertainment about UFOs and extraterrestrials and paranormal, guys, turn it off and forget about the UFO stuff. Develop yourselves. We need to develop ourselves. We are all, all of us, at a you know not exactly highly advanced level of thinking and behavior and development, and we're in a world of hurt because we've hurt the world. Okay, I get it. All right. How about Jeff in uh, Palm Springs, California? Hey, John. Thank you very much for taking my call. I love your show, and I love your format. Um, I, I need to apologize to your guest, first off, because I, I'm going to say some things. First of all, you know, this is by the, the street rules. No one works for nothing, okay? And then his thing about the creation, every creation needs a creator. And my third thing is, if they picked Mr. Meyer, why would they pick a guy that can't communicate his own thoughts? And, and then I also had okay. to say, 
um, what does he have to say about ghosts and spirits and all these things? Because if I'm to believe this, everything this gentleman has to say tonight sums up coast to coast, and we don't need to listen to the radio, that Mike Myers the guy, and he knows everything, and then everything else is kind of, um, you know, just, uh, um, I, I just, unfortunately, sir, do not buy it. Okay, can, I, and, um, can you hang in there for a sec while I try to answer some of what you said? Yeah, hold on, man. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. I think he means Billy Meyer because Mike Myers uh, plays Dr. Evil and all that. Um, <laughs> I think, okay, uh, there's nothing here for you to believe, and you don't have to believe anything. I think the first thing you said is nobody works for nothing. If you mean me, I do not get paid to do this. If I get paid, uh, it's generally if I can make a few hundred bucks at a UFO lecture or if somebody buys products that basically I've spent my hard-earned money to uh, produce or other people who have written books have done. I only wish I could say I make a fortune from doing it. I do not get paid to do my representation, my travel, my production. Etc. It's all on me because I have a passion for it, and I don't complain about it. I love what I do. Um, as for, I think, gosh, I wish. What was your second issue? Was it um, about Meyer? Oh, sorry. Uh, can uh, all right. Let me let me do the ones I remember here about. Oh, he bailed. I'm sorry. He bailed. Oh, he is here. Je yeah, Jeff. No, no, no. Every creation needs a creator. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That was it. Uh, that is true, and all I was saying before was that they have a very specific and, if you will, scientific you know, cosmology that does not involve deities. It doesn't involve gods who created things. Now, you're not, you don't have to believe that either. Uh, I have a spiritual teaching section on my website. It's free. You don't have to pay anything to, to read it. There's something called Introduction to the Spiritual Teaching, and they talk about what they call the creation. And there's a whole bunch of articles and you know, points of view. You mentioned also, I think, ghosts and spirits. And Meyer has written extensively. You, oh, I know. You said that here's a guy who can't express himself. Uh, Meyer writes in high German and probably is the most precise uh, author you will ever read. The problem is in being able to translate from German to English, because English is an inferior language in terms of the specificity and the uh, words that don't exist even to convey the meaning that words in German do. I don't speak German very well. I can speak a little bit, but I, I can't read the material in German. It's beyond me. Um, Meyer is recognized as being nothing short of brilliant in his writing. He can communicate it. He's not somebody who is uh, tasked with going out to the public to present it. He doesn't need to. He writes it. He publishes it. I and any number of other people who will you know, either do it simultaneous or after me will, will go out there and uh, you know, make noise about it. Um, there's nothing for you to, to believe here, and that's part of the big you know, purpose of, of presenting this information. If it interests you enough to even criticize it or debunk it, it's there for you to do that. If you don't think it's accurate or right, uh, you're not going to be excommunicated from a non-existent church. So it's, it's, it's freedom. You know, do with it what you can. And if you – look, I can only convey truly so much even in, in three hours um, – and I can only do it also to the best of my own knowledge, and my knowledge is small about this, the, the totality of this. So when we're looking for answers about the creation and we start getting figures of, of zillions of years and this happened then and, you know, the form, why don't our scientists know that, this other, that, that there have been other uh, deeper uh, physical worlds that have existed because they've already turned back into energy? You're talking, if you're talking many multi-billions and trillions of years, why don't our scientists recognize that you're not going to see things out there that have already dissolved back to energy before they take form again? It, it, it's, there's so much here that all I can say is if it interests you enough even to want to skewer it, go ahead and get into it and see what your thinking processes bring you. I have two questions for you guys. First, uh, are there any Palladian people living among us? And um, second, what description, what do the people look like? Okay, no, there are none living among us. Uh, and Meyer has described uh, the Pleiaren, or some people you know, say Pleiadian, as uh, looking very much like uh, you know, Europeans. Uh, they're primarily Caucasian. Meyer has met with people from races that look uh, Mediterranean, black, Asian. These would be the, you know, how we would identify the, the people based on how they look. Uh, apparently, in this universe, uh, when it came into being and when human life was brought into it, uh, there were something like 42 million plus human races with 343 different skin colors. As for this thing about, you know, extraterrestrials on Earth, no, there are zero extraterrestrials living on Earth. However, there are over 52 million extraterrestrial human spirits that are in the reincarnational cycle on Earth, meaning that people whose spirit originally came from another place, which doesn't make it better, just, you know, the universe is one thing and there's different parts of it, and people have been coming to this Earth for well over 22 million years. When you die on a planet, that's where you reincarnate. And so there are many people who have a, you know, extraterrestrial origins of the spirit form, but once you're here and you're on Earth, you're an Earth person, and you may have no 
uh, connection to your former personalities, certainly no remembering of, of things, and this is what we go through in evolution, and it's a long, long process. This is a matter of complete and total self-responsibility. Let me give you an answer also about the so-called free energy thing. That may or may not come to fruition, uh, you know, the way we conceive or think we should have it, but the play Aaron gave Meyer the answer for our energy needs, the greater amount of our energy needs, is to use what's called deep geothermal energy, such as is being developed in some parts of Europe now. This is a non-toxic way of tapping into an inexhaustible source of heat that can be converted to energy. We can run virtually everything, even including cars, by, by having electric cars with batteries that are easily charged from systems that are turbines, you know, moved by heat energy coming up from the earth. If we start thinking in these streamlined ways and we don't get too hung up on the conspiracy end, taking the power back, like you're hinting at. We, there is a free online forum where people all over the world are discussing the Meyer material. It's linked from my website. There's information in the, material, in the Meyer material on how we do certain things to take our power back. But we're not forced to do any of it. There's even methodologies for putting down terrorism and wars and all this. It's there. Uh, I mentioned my own little thing, the standing in spirit. It's a highly useful means of monitoring oneself. Another means would be to learn Vipassana meditation. These are means of observing the self so that we start to figure out what the heck we're doing in our, in our heads and our hearts and how do we start being productive. Then we are linking up with other people of like mind. We're not worried about throwing stones at the government. We're, we are withdrawing support from things that don't work. For instance, teach by example is a principle in this case. Brenda called earlier. She was talking about famines. I should have thought about it. Farming, learning how to grow food, learning how to become interdependent with others of like mind where we're not hung up on accumulating things for the sake of accumulation. I'm shotgunning things at you because you're thinking the, the right way. And by pursuing that intention and, and using whatever tools and mechanisms you feel work for you, you will find yourself coming in contact with other persons. And you can do it deliberately through the, um, as we say, through the, uh, you know, the, the, the forum, online forum. You can, you know, join. I, I'm on Facebook, other people that are doing this. There's all sorts of stuff. Let's not worry so much about them the power structure is a slow thing to change, and just to destroy something or rip it down without having something viable in its place it leads to chaos and anarchy. The prediction for this country is we're going to have chaos and anarchy as things break down. So those who want to position themselves in a sensible way, there's plenty of communication that can be done. It's not conspiratorial. It's not even revolutions against governments. It's just putting your support where, you, where it belongs and self-responsibility. So it's late at night I'm babbling, but th that's some of the stuff. Well, I was, I was calling specifically to address your guest's uh, question about why people in the uh, UFO investigation community, uh, community uh, don't look into all this, these different claims about Billy Meyer. Um, having, you, having formerly been a UFO investigator and having first come upon a Billy Meyer case probably back about 1990, uh, I can tell you that over the years I've seen how some of the evidence has been rather dubious. Uh, there are photographs that have been released that are clearly um, are not real. Um, and I say that because I'm a, I have a background in video production and special effects. So the, and then also another problem I've run across as well, because uh, since the time I had that, I was involved in video, I've moved on to physics, a lot of things that um, your guest is very, you know, impressed by and seems to think they're mind-boggling, uh, that, that they talk about cosmology and whatnot, it, they really aren't. I mean, the whole multiverse model, has been around in various forms since 1957, uh, and that's just in terms of the, the physics community. I mean, if you look at the, Re the Rancher book, if you want to add the spiritual dimension to it, that goes way back even before that with multiverse models and that. So what I'm saying, and also in particular, uh, there was something, and I can't remember what the details are, because I've been past this Billy Meyer thing for about over 15 years, but the, uh, there was something they had, there was some kind of claim about time travel that was made, and that's one of my areas of, uh, of uh, research is the whole idea of temporal mechanics and how time travel could, or could not be possible. And the, the version that I, was, I read, according to some, one particular story that Meyer had, this didn't wash. And if you do a space-time diagram of the whole thing. Okay, can, I, can I jump in and give you some response yeah. to what you said? First of all, uh, I don't know if you've read the photo analysis done on Meyer's photographs and the analysis. I have. Okay, and so 
and I'm serious about this, if you want to submit a critique on the methodologies used to analyze and authenticate Meyer's photographs, including the infrared development that Marcel Vogel uh, created and that showed the UFO in a photograph with a Mirage uh, jet that was sent up to intercept it, 11 photographs existed of that. If you want to critique the Nippon TV assessment of Meyer's films as being authentic, uncut, and showing indeed uh, an object disappearing within one frame, that's fine, and I would look at it and I'd post it. Um, just stating things that, well, you know, something isn't so, and this is why I've stayed away for most of the evening on the UFO part of it, because people, and I posted a blog today, somebody addressed a lot of this stuff about the UFO evidence, and I posted it in my blog, I gave them credit for it. It's the least important thing right now, and when you want to focus only on the cosmology of the universe, which is, uh, admittedly, as I said, something we cannot prove or establish to be true, and I have no problem saying that, but I cited, I don't know if you caught the whole show, I cited, and I could cite all night, specific scientific information published verifiably by Meyer prior to official discovery. There was one a few weeks ago. The Japanese just did an experiment with pig DNA and spinach genes. Meyer was told about that in 1987. This experiment will take place in Japan after the year 2000. It just happened. And, you know, there's so much of it that if we decided that we would do the program only on that, uh, I could do the laundry list. But I have an article on my site all about it. Will humanity wake up in time? You can read them. Go through them. If you want to contest them, it's fair enough to do it, but I need a much more scientific rebuttal to scientifically established information to say that a test wasn't valid because you don't agree with it. It's not scientific to me. And I, uh, of course, had the people at, um, not only did I have David Froning, an astrophysicist with a top security, top secret security clearance, get up on my stage and tell people that he and the group of scientists he works with have made breakthroughs in their understanding of hyperspace propulsion from Meyer's information and his films, and that their calculations are within 20% of the figures he published thank you very much, good night, I'm not saying anymore, not only have a bunch of other scientists in various fields authenticated Meyer's information, but this is the kind of thing that you can do yourself. And I don't, I no longer, I mean, I don't yell at people, I think I used to, but I don't accept from people telling, well, this isn't so because I say so. I can't tell you that it's so because I say so. I'm going to point people to the documentation. The cosmology yeah. of the universe is a rough one, let's face it. Neither you nor no. I. You know, <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, I'll go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's say, as far as the photos, real quickly, it's that, like the cake, you know, you know what I'm talking about, the, uh, the, the cake thing, uh, the spaceship, the cake spaceship photo, mm -hmm. they, they refer to it as some kind of, um, I forget what they call it, some, it's, it has to do with a cake, but anyway, because that's what the spaceship looks like. The wedding cake. Ship. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that doesn't look real at all. It that's has to fine. do because of the way light would be reflecting off of that particular object. I'm not saying it's like that for all of them. I'm just saying, fine, I, but if one of them is authentic, one, that, I, one, that one doesn't, doesn't look real at all. I understand, and, and there are right. people that say that. So here, I just want to say this. If one of Meyer's photos is authentic, we have a problem, NASA. You know, and he took well over 1,200 of them. He had hundreds stolen. He, had, he took 30 films. Only eight survived. So this is why I'm saying to, the UFO evidence debate is, at this point, least interesting to me because we're getting verification of critical information that was verifiably published up to 50 years ago, will we catch on or will we sit around arguing about lights in the sky? That's you know, where I come from. And I respect your, your, your passion on it, but feel free to write me and send me your rebuttals. Well, you know, disinformation, all it takes is one little bit of disinformation that's, um, yeah. that, that seems credible, and it really causes problems. There's nothing to say that these photographs weren't doctored and then re-released at some point, is there? Well, actually, because they were, you know, they were, Meyer took his first UFO photos in India in 1964, and if people will go and search, put the search term India in my website, they will see up to eight crafts photographed in the middle of nowhere with, and there were like a hundred witnesses at least, number one. Number two, the final photograph on that page is a white cross in the sky with Meyer sitting on the ground. This photo was taken with a Kodak Bellows camera circa 1940 or 45. Wow. And these things were not faked, but people don't even know about it. And I brought in, when we made our film, which is freely available online, I brought in an expert consultant to the U.S. Army Special Forces who teaches these people how to recognize liars and danger in, in seconds. I had him analyze Meyer speaking with the sound off, even though Meyer was speaking in German, so that he would just have to read his body language. I had him analyze Pobal Cheng, the other witness in India, who saw all this stuff firsthand. And he said about both these people, they're telling the truth. Hey. And, you know, so this is where people don't know about this stuff, and I invite them to jump in. Well, that's it. Full immersion all the way in or all the way out. Very quickly, my friend, anything specific on 2012? We're a little ways off from the big day on the 21st of next December, but anything specific well, in that regard? Well, to make it easy for everybody, there is an article on my homepage, 2012, and there are some links in there. 2012 will be rough because of solar events that we don't yet know or we haven't been warned or told. If Polar shift, any of that? Pardon me? Polar shift, any of that? 
magnetic shift is underway. Okay, Not listen. Yeah. This has been a fast three hours, Michael. we got to go. I hear the music in the background. So we're going to do this again sometime, and I'll, I'll see you out there in Cali one of these days. I'd love it. Thanks a lot. Hey, as, as I said at the start of the show tonight, uh, the truth will set you free. Knowledge can make you a little bit nuts. If you reach into yourself, uh, you'll know the truth. Chances are you already do.